floor for any questions. Please enter your questions into the question box on the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen during or after the presentation. I will address all questions when our speakers conclude. With that, I'll turn things over to David. Thanks, Austin. Uh, my name is David Roof, and I'm the Legal Project Management Officer of Becker Donaldson and the chair of our uh, Legal Project Management Interest Group with the ABA uh, that organized this webinar. In 2016, our group started what we call an Innovative Law Practice Technique Series, and we've produced a number of sessions on topics such as LPM, contract management, knowledge management, pricing, uh, and estimating fees in the U.S. and Australia, all of which are available on ABA's YouTube channel. Um, we're very excited about uh, today's uh, speakers and sessions, redefining the relationship between law schools and legal practice. We have with us today um, Anthony Kroll, uh, the Dean and President of the New York Law School. Uh, we also have Steve Harbour, who's the Head uh, of Legal Partnerships uh, for SEAL Software. Uh, we also have Charles Post, who is the Director uh, of legal data management and advisory uh, and, and managing counsel uh, uh, for his company. And then, um, and then um, we have Ari Kaplan, uh, who is an industry analyst and who's going to be leading today's session. So Ari, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, David. And thanks to your the ABA Law Practice Division for giving us this opportunity. I want to start this conversation by showing the audience a, a bit of a quote, and I want to highlight how remarkable it is that we get to have a conversation with the head of a prominent law school, an industry veteran who has been responsible for incredible changes in Steve Harbor, and a practitioner in-house who has been on the vanguard of leveraging technology. It's such an extraordinary combination, and I'm really excited about it. So, Dean Crowell, I want to just start with you. In the Business of Law Report, which I had the privilege of researching for and authoring as part of the New York Law School's initiative, you made this point about the profession undergoing profound change and that lawyers at, at firms and corporate legal departments have to be fluent in the technical and operational needs of their clients and organizations. What What is your vision and the vision of the faculty for the Business of Law Institute? Well, thanks so much, Ari, and it's really a great pleasure to be on with you and the others on on the call, uh, all of whom I've had um, the ability to work with in a variety of ways towards this common goal of creating this business of law institute. And and I want to say that it's really important for us to understand and appreciate the profound shifts in how legal services are delivered, <clears throat> not just in the United States, but really globally at this point. And with the advent of so many new technologies and the ability uh, for legal operations to be shaped and expedited through a variety of um, of applications. We, we need to understand what that means for the everyday practicing lawyer. We also need to know what it means for uh, an industry that depends, it's very client service industry, but it also depends on uh, a range of opportunities to cut costs and deliver effective service. And so what we aim to do is really um, not just give our students the training they need to be lawyers, but a training they need to also engage with the law in the most modern technique. It, it's really an obligation that we as uh, legal educators have to delivering to the profession a new generation of lawyers who understand uh, both worlds, how to bridge those worlds, and also what are going to be the dominant trends and how practice areas will be shaped as a result of, uh, of different factors, whether it be privacy, cybersecurity, um, a range of e-discovery, the application of AI. Um, all these things matter, and new lawyers have to understand uh, how they will play out in, everyday, uh, in the everyday profession. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about the New York Law School approach was that instead of anticipating what might be interesting and necessary for students, New York Law School embarked on a, a broad-based research campaign. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about the background 
in asking questions of people in the market and trying to understand how this could be best serve the student community and frankly the legal community at large and this was a really interesting comment from one of the participants that law's traditionally been taught to the final of the bar exam and that the business of law institute is going to teach to the job the career the evolution of the legal profession which is something that's that's really been resonating so from november of 2017 to february of 2018 i personally interviewed 29 individuals uh, including New York Law School faculty, surveyed over a hundred lawyers, both with corporations and with corporate legal departments. So complemented the in-depth qualitative interviews with a really a broad-based quantitative analysis and then conducted two focus groups of New York Law School students, day division students, evening division students, one of those focus groups with Steve Harbour. And I think both of us were were quite impressed at the level of enthusiasm with the students and also just wanted to show who contributed, who who spoke to us. So you see here folks from law firms, leaders of law firms, leaders of corporations, leaders of technology companies, and it was an incredibly broad-based group of people who generously shared their perspectives. And I think it's uh, it's, you know, kind of indicative. And so, Steve, I just wanted to turn to you because there were a number of stats that came through. Clearly, strong market demand. 68% of the law firm leaders reported that coursework in some of the things that, that the dean just alluded to would give employees a prospective employees a competitive advantage. 64% said cybersecurity. And then, you know, you see here that law firm leaders would like their associates to have experience in different areas. As as someone who, you know, an industry veteran, someone who's created and sold multiple companies that were really ahead of their time. What is the creation of a business of law institute at your alma mater? It should be noted that you and Charles are both New York Law School alums. What does that represent about the legal industry right now? Um, thanks, Ari. I think what it represents is the acknowledgement, both in the law firm world, but potentially more in the in-house world and legal services world that skills over and above the traditional legal curriculum make a job applicant or a graduate that much more uh, desirable. And so when I graduated from law school, there was basically, like many of us, there was one course, you know, you, you, you go to a big law firm or try to get into a law firm. Um, and through, for a number of reasons, my career took a different path and I got into the area of how could law improve, excuse me, how could technology improve the practice of law. And so really, um, my, my work with New York Law School and my view on the market is that there are all these opportunities for talented uh, law students um, that they very, they're very often not aware of just because it's not, it's, it, it's not the historical norm. Um, and so, for example, in our, in our study, as Ari mentioned, when we spoke to corporate legal departments, they were very interested in students who had certain skills like data privacy, and they were actually looking for more applicants as opposed to law firms that, you know, it, it's getting tougher and tougher to get some of those jobs as, as the associate classes uh, shrink. And so that was really the idea is just to make the students aware of all of the different opportunities uh, that are available outside of the traditional law firm uh, path. So Charles, I wanna, I wanna turn to you a little bit because Steve, Talk to a little bit about corporate law department leaders, what what they think could help prepare students. Now, as a practitioner and you know, thinking back to law school, what are the things that you'd like to see and that you like to see in students? And you are going to be participating in a, in a master class at New York Law School. I'd love to hear the kinds of things that, that you're thinking of and kind of what motivated you to participate in the Business of Law Initiative. Hey, thank you, Ari, and uh, I appreciate being part of the uh, the panel here. So, um, 
what motivated me, I'll start with that and then we can pivot towards uh, the other um, questions that you had. Uh, what motivated me to participate uh, in, what the, in this uh, really groundbreaking uh, law school initiative is that the, the marketplace is digitizing at a breakneck speed. And the law practices more generally um, and the skills that are taught in law schools more generally um, don't necessarily align exactly to where the marketplace is. And the ability, uh, and the, the more aligned you are, the more competitive the student body is um, to be able to get jobs, to be able to add value out of the gate um, when they are getting jobs and opportunities. And, the, and during their law school experience, getting the practical experience to be able to show that value um, in the market. So what I wanted, uh, my motivation is to make that impact and help the law school mold a program to be able to not only pivot towards this digitization, but also to pivot and lean into it. And the leaning into it is the part of the practicalism. So as part of the master classes, um, you know, at least the one that I will be doing, um, and, and I would I would also hope subsequent learning, uh, learning labs, um, what we're going to do is we're not focusing on theory and concept and uh, and what we are focusing on is practical job skills that are in, required in the marketplace or will be required in the marketplace in the near term um, because the marketplace is now uh, a new has a new dynamic and that dynamic is that lawyers are working with technologists lawyers are also working with the businesses and they have to be able to apply the law to the business the products um, the services and also how does that translate into the technology and make sure the technology is abiding by the law as well and helping build those products. So the class is going to focus on those practical elements and then hopefully subsequent uh, learning labs um, will actually be able to um, get first, you know, hands on experience um, and to some degree with the actual tools that are deployed in the marketplace. And as you can see on the screen, it's really consistent with the things that Charles and Steve, you both mentioned, because 64% of corporate law department leaders said the best way that law schools can prepare is to take advantage of, of different opportunities. And, and there are different, um, you know, what, what corporate law department leaders said that they wanted their outside law firms to understand. And then, of course, there's this idea that students want exposure and hands-on experience. And this Business of Law Institute really aligns that. And so I just wanted to to open this up, so there is a slide here that talks about how important is it for your employees to understand uh, the use and practice of, uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity or or e-discovery or privacy. Did Dean Crowell? Did any of these expectations surprise you in terms of the, you know, which which factors were most important to law firms? Because we asked law firms and we asked corporations for what was most interesting to them. Yeah, I think I think that when you really look at why we wanted to do a market study, we decided that the best way to understand how to develop the right program would be to ask the market. I think I think as um uh Charles Post just said, you know, there's such a dynamic set of changes afoot and that there hasn't been that traditional alignment between law school programs and what the market needs and what's going on. So this is why we wanted to know what the level of importance was in terms of the variety of things that we felt um, a business of law institute should should uh, seek to address. And so it was really quite interesting, for instance, to to see the the big focus on a number of these areas. Um, I would say that we were. Um, in some regards, pleasantly surprised by some things. And then I, I was surprised that other areas were not as, as heavily represented. So certainly cybersecurity is something I expected to see a high degree of interest and privacy um, and e-discovery. But I actually expected e-discovery and, and technology-assisted review to actually be, be perhaps even more. Um, I, I also expected knowledge management and, and risk and compliance to be even a little greater. So it was interesting to see where the emphasis is, to see where uh, the market was most interested in seeing coursework. What was also interesting to us, and, and we'll discuss this a little bit more as we get deeper into, into the results, 
was that um, a degree program wasn't necessarily something that the market thought was important. Um, that, that advanced coursework or modules that could lead to some level of proficiency and certification would be good, but, but, but a specific degree or a master's degree or an LLM in this area was not something that was necessarily needed or desired by the marketplace. So that was of also a, a great importance for us to understand. When we so we we really tried to counter law firm expectations and client in terms of corporate counsel and you know corporate leadership kind of expectations and there was a slight you see there's a slight variation here it's fifty five percent of when we asked how important is it for your employees to understand the use and practice for law firm expectations and then helping law firms meet client expectations you know when we asked how important is it for your outside law firms you see that there's a much bigger uh, differentiation. Charles, what do you think is driving the differentiation between what law firms are thinking and corporations are thinking? Um, just their role in the marketplace. So, um, the, you know, you're not, businesses and companies aren't going to law firms for, you know, running their business. They're running their business and law firms are providing advice to that business in very in certain areas. The certain areas are more of the focus where the law firms are focused, where the businesses, you might see those answers more uh, more broadly distributed. Um, and there's different people who are responding to this, obviously. And so you're going to have with their roles and functions of what they see at the law firms as well as uh, in, in the corporations in-house um, and how they're responding to that. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic, but it's usually positioned based on the function of the, pro of the um, participant in the marketplace. So law firms play a different role than the corporations um, with respect to each other. Steve, when we asked about where the greatest growth areas are for law firms and, you know, what, what, people think could be very effective. We got a bunch of different interesting answers, but how do you think the expectations of the skills that employers want from their new lawyers has changed? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, um, technology proficiency or the ability to work with tools was, was always a plus, um, or it was something that could be, that could be taught. I think what we're finding is that there may be instances where a skill that somebody like Charles teaches a group of students in school, they'll get to their firm or to their in-house job with a skill and they'll be the most skilled person in that department. And I think that's the real opportunity, especially in areas like artificial intelligence that are brand new and there's really a shortage of people who have any experience or even understanding in the space. And so I would say that that's, that's going to be the difference is, you know, students who either have some of these skill sets before law school or develop them in law school and can actually go and add value day one. Um, I think that that is a lot more um, desirable or, or sought after today than it had been in the past. You know, I have to share something that I don't know how many listeners on this program have uh, teenage children, but I, I have two teenagers, a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old, and I was at a, a parent-teacher conference evening last night for my son, who's in 10th grade, and my daughter, uh, who's in 8th grade the night before, and there were two things that stood out for me. None of them had anything to do with social studies or math or science. I sat in on one class for my daughter and and on the, the slide when we walked into the room said welcome to eighth grade robotics and it was fascinating to me and then last night when i was at the high school my son is taking a video editing class some digital video editing class and the teacher said something that really uh, resonated with me that was very consistent with what you just said steve which was this is the class that offers practical experience to your students. I have many, many students who end up making, you know, some crazy amount of thousands of dollars editing video for businesses locally. And my wife, when we walked out, she said, wow, that was a really, it was like the one class that really stood out because maybe our kids could have some practical experience that they could bring to their 
marketplace. So, you know, it was, it was exactly what you had just mentioned, but, you know, it just sort of really hit home. And I think that it's starting at all levels. So to the expectation, if you have an eighth grader that's already taking robotics, then by the time they get to law school, they will really, there's an expectation that not only will I learn the law and how to think like a lawyer, but the practical application is is incredibly profound. And, you know, did Crowell, in New York Law School, I mean, you've always been focused on essentially bringing New York to the law school and to giving your students, uh, you know, an, a level of exposure that others just don't have because of the location or because of the nature of the faculty. Uh, one of the things that we tried to ask about was how law firms can stand out. What are the things that they can do? And And we saw that there were some some details here, project management experience, and I know David, who's, who's uh, who introduced us, is the you know kind of renowned for uh, legal project management, and I think it's interesting. He might appreciate the fact that so many individuals were were interested in this. Was where is the Business of Law Institute's focus in terms of a practical? component and how is that different from what what what's happening in the in the current state of legal education so i think for us one of the one of the most strategic uh, opportunities we have is really to understand how experiential learning uh, is really shaping sort of the next generation of approach to legal education and and more and more um, not just because of the ABA is requiring more experiential learning, learning for students generally, but we see that as some of the greatest edge that's available for our students to um, not only learn what the market wants, but how to deliver to the market in real time what they want by getting hands-on experience. So a lot of the way we will structure this curriculum for the Business of Law Institute is by having um, formal instruction, but the, the core of the learning experience will be by allowing students um, to put their hands on the technology, to work alongside lawyers uh, and technologists and understand how um, different, uh, different programs, different processes actually work in practice uh, and, and how to get that experience and how to meet expectations right on. So it's one of the, one of the things that I've observed um, there are a number of programs across the country that are addressing these issues. Um, I, I don't think any as holistically as we seek to address them. But the key distinguishing factor is they really focus on principles and theory and not on how to actually take that basic knowledge and, and, and put it into gear through the hands-on training. And so that's where I think the experience from working with um, experienced practitioners and those who are, are using the technology as part of business operations and legal operations will be of most value, and, and that's where we really seek to have the edge. One thing I want to point out to the audience is that when you're looking at these slides, so you notice here that 27% said that artificial intelligence is a differentiator for their law firms. And so one of the things we said was, you know, which which kind of skills, so, you know, clearly e-discovery, cyber, project management, these are different than skills and expectations. And it was it was interesting to see that distinction that law firms are really thinking, you know, more than a quarter of the firms that we spoke to are thinking about this issue and then talking about practice groups. So, you know, 11% have an AI practice group, data analytics, you know, number of people have privacy practice groups and and the like. So it's really, you know, and, and of course, this research is, is we're happy to make it, it's available. New York Law School has made it available um, generously to the audience. So there's a, we'll talk about how to download it. But um, Charles, it says here, you know, we talked, we asked, do you want new associates with experience in this area? And you're quite expert in a number of different aspects of technology. When you meet uh, new law students, you know, do you hear a lot about, uh, you know, AI experience or familiarity with uh, project management, data analytics, things like that? No, I don't, uh, generally. Um, they, today, you know, the marketplace 
um, particularly, you know, new associates or, you know, you know, law students that have now graduated or entering, uh, you know, passing the bar and entering the marketplace, they, they don't, they, if they had a past like work life before, you know, between law school and, um, you know, before going to law school, then, or they work part time and go to law school part time, then you'll hear about those experiences to the extent that they deal with project management, working with technology um, there. You, you, you have, I haven't heard it um, yet, which is also why I know it's a, you know, it's really a commodity skill set or, you know, knowledge base that, um, you know, the Dean and Steve are honing on because that's a, a, a need in the market and these new technologies. AI is not a wow factor anymore. When it's wow, it's front page news. Now it's a, there's an expectation around it, and not even just an expectation from, um, you know, from from from, you know, the uh, the marketplaces. It's, it's expectation from clients. It's expectation from companies that we're leveraging technologies. We're doing this. Otherwise, we're not in the pack. We're not leading the pack. We might be behind. Um, and so the people that we were bringing on board, if people have experience with tools, with projects and the law, it, you know, competitive advantage out the window, you might be in a class of your own. And that's what we're trying to do is develop a, a new class of their own within the marketplace as they come out of school. And that's the um, really the, the uh, idea. Um, and I know Steve's been doing this, the, these types of technologies for, for years. So he's had this crystal ball and knowing that those things are coming and getting ahead of it. Um, and now we're trying to, you know, share the, that, that knowledge with the, the law school to be able to train people to get into this space um, on a law school level. And that's the, I think that's the key. And I'll, Steve, Ari, you, can I jump yeah. in for one sec? Yes, can I just, I, So just to follow up on Charles's point, I think it's significant to know that only 25% or, or less than 50% of the, of the legal people surveyed talked or understood AI. And to Charles's point, if you looked at other business units within corporations or companies, it would be 99%. Right. And so this is an area where the legal profession in general is behind the curve in terms of where the rest of the world is heading. And so I would look at that number and say that's a big warning sign for law firms, um, because, as Charles said, the corporations are already tearing ahead with it. And when they find out that the that the way that their outside counsel is still handling a large contract with you matter for instance is throwing you know 20 associates at it that's not going to last very long um, and so I, I would see that as a wake-up call i will just add that i have conducted a, a, a lot of research speaking to legal operations leaders or others in the field and you know at least one data point that was very powerful this summer was uh, you know almost all of them said that the amount that they're going to spend on ai in the coming year will increase. Their expectation was an increase. So regardless of what the percentage is here, the money is going towards those kinds of things. And then there was this idea of, you know, what do you want new associates with experience in? The law firm preferences, accelerated research and uh, proficiency in legal tech. Even statistical analysis was 29%, project management 42%. Dean Crowell, does any of this surprise you in terms of the the specific types of experience that law firms wanted from new associates to have? I'm glad to see this. This is this this to me is falling in line with a lot of the assumptions and um, areas that we we think where there needs to be greater focus. So I was glad to see this, but I, it is very interesting. You know. If you look at, um, I think, both the awareness of legal management trends and, and the proficiency in legal technology selection and operation, I think that's encouraging for us to, to understand that law firms are paying attention and that it validates where we want to go with this. Um, so I'm 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 glad to see it. I think the understanding of statistical analysis. I actually would have thought that would have been would have been a little bit more, uh, but I'm certainly glad to see the familiarity with accounting and budget, um, and that that again it will it will play into 
how we shape programs. And I think for some of these areas, it's not just with business of law. It may be, it may be just the general practice of law across the curriculum to integrate some of these uh, areas into, into a variety of programs uh, that fall beyond just what we're trying to accomplish with the Institute. When I was analyzing the data and I saw that 68% said accelerated research capabilities, I just have to think that it's because a lot of the initial research that a new lawyer would have done years ago, or certainly that I did when I graduated in 1997, is done by a machine and done within seconds. And the same is true for, for some of these other things. I mean, all of these factors create what people have described as kind of the T-shaped lawyer as opposed to someone who's just really just focused on analyzing a, a particular document. Steve, do you do you see this as an opportunity for students or do you see this as a, a hurdle? Well, again, I, I, I think it's it's a huge opportunity. Obviously, you can't say every student is going to take to it in the same way. But I think a large percentage of law school graduates who are, you know, for whatever reason, are not going or looking at the traditional path, rather than struggling to figure out what to do, or in many instances, at least in New York Law School, the students have all of these tremendous skills that are typically not um, really sought after, or, or they don't really show up uh, on an application or an interview when they're, when they're going to a law firm. So I think the real opportunity now is that the students who either have these pre-existing skill sets or are able to develop them um, at school um, will enable them to have an incredibly rewarding and you know find a successful career, um, even if they don't uh, you know even if they don't take the traditional uh, path. Yeah, can I just add to that? I, one of the things that I, I think is helpful with, with that last slide is really is that slide becomes a communications tool for us to work with students on. Um, students want to know what the market wants. Uh, you know, there's a variety of data points that students will consider. Um, and they ask a variety of people what they think the market wants. This is actually a real study that 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 reveals what the market wants. Uh, and it's directed at law schools and designing their programs. So I think it's incredibly helpful and meaningful, uh, not just for the student who's the consumer of legal education, but for those who provide it. Charles, I want to just turn the turn your attention and the audience's attention to this slide. You know, we I will say that David and I were at an event uh, together and uh, overseas, and we were talking about billing for legal project management, and there was a, a really, a really strong interest in paying for professionals with a certain type of specialization, and you know, agreeing to that invoice, uh, you know, without question, in an era where the invoices are constantly questioned because there needs to be an incredible level of granularity. And so we asked, would your firm benefit if it could bill first and second years with some additional type of specialization, maybe in data analytics, maybe in legal project management, maybe in operations of some kind? And uh, you know, the number was significantly yes. Are you seeing any of that in the? interactions that you're currently having? Well, I, I think if there's, um, uh, you know, if there's a value proposition uh, for for the first or second year's associates that, that differ from, you know, more senior associates or partners that are bringing to the table, of course, you can, that, that's something that I think anyone would consider in the marketplace, particularly me. Um, but, uh, that value proposition has to come with, um, you know, a, a value add that's that's distinguishable and, and, uh, from from others, and that's what we're trying to offer with the the school. Um, you can have first year and second year associates that are more familiar with the technology than senior associates. So they're although they might not have the number of years under their belt with respect to, um, you know, uh, experience. Um, they do have a unique experience, and that unique experience can distinguish them, um, and that's a value proposition that people can buy. 
Um, so uh, understanding, you know, legal project managers. Why do I, you know, why do I like legal project managers, for example, with technology experience? Because it's a very, it's a unique skill set that doesn't exist widely in the marketplace today. If we, if we, as a, as the law school, um, and supporting the dean and, and, and Steve and others in, in building out these programs, that could become a reality because they're coming to 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 um, the marketplace, two law firms, with a new value add out of the gate that doesn't already exist potentially at the places that they're being hired. Um, so uh, I think that's a that's a distinguisher where folks like myself can can um, consider the uh, you know billing for first or second year associates, but I, I you know because it's it's based upon a, a new criteria. I just wanted to share a couple of quotes from the report, which you can read in the report. Uh, one in-house lawyer said, a first or second, and, and, and you know, this is a quote, I'm not saying this, a first or second year associate is generally useless. Give them more practical experience and training. Another said, schools have to augment their course load to create a practical element. And even a law firm partner said, project management skills would be great because efficiency is key. And Charles, I, one, one other thing I wanted to ask, how will you adapt and tailor your instruction to the students to accommodate some of these, you know, this interest and the interest in giving student that edge? So I actually think it's fairly simple. The, the analytical skills that you develop in law school are not just applicable to the law. You could think about a product or a service or an end-to-end -end workflow of how a project should go or how a um, product or service should be offered. So that's how, you know, at least in-house, um, I think about it. And taking that analytical skill and, and, re and focusing it on what's going on in the marketplace, what's going on at a bank, what's going on at a company, and bringing that to the school is key. So using tools. So tools for example, AI tools. Are artificial intelligence tools highly different amongst each other, amongst their usage, amongst their application? N not, they're not light years apart. So the ability to use one tool allows a skill set and allows a familiarity to another. And, that, and building that transferable skill set amongst the tool usage, understanding capabilities, limitations, and how it actually applies for deploying a product or service is the types of practical skills and lessons learned that I'm going to be trying to bring to a master class, for example, or to a course. Um, bringing the, the, the job to the student, bringing the marketplace to the student um, in that environment based on a certain set, set of skill uh, conditions is the idea um, so that the student gets a real practical experience and that experience will this will be because of the marketplace I think is fairly thin with the, with those types of people they'll be unique in that market just by by graduating and having to having having taken a, a, a class um, so that that's how at least I I view it and that's how we you know at least I'm expecting to be uh, teaching it and how I've personally trained you know people on my team I have a job today that didn't exist 10 years ago 20 years ago, the people that I've hired on my team, their jobs didn't exist 10, 20 years ago. Um, and the trainings that we're doing um, are similar types of things that I would teach uh, to law students that I know are acquired skill in the marketplace now because people are starting to adapt and the rules of the road are changing. So the laws are changing more towards fintech, uh, financial technology. Um, and as financial technology becomes mainstream and as rules become technology based, uh, what we're going to see is that the skill sets are going to be doing that. And we're trying to do that as, as, in a more expedited fashion to align with the market expectations. Steve, Charles just mentioned the advantages of, of a student who will receive just by virtue of the fact of being familiar with some of these issues. And then one of one of the things we asked about uh, were areas of opportunity. What are the most promising areas of opportunity for new lawyers according to in-house folks? And you see, I think it's so fascinating. Uh, I'm we'll, you know, geeking out here on the data, but I think it's so fascinating that the 
AI line at the top, every time we probe a little bit further and ask some questions, that line just seems to get longer and longer. And so law firms, the line was a little shorter. And then we asked Charles for his insights on AI. And now we, when we turn to corporations, it mirrors exactly what he's saying in that and it's much bigger. I'm just curious, you have uh, had the opportunity to hire many people in the various companies that, that you've started, that you've worked with. Are there certain qualities that stand out? Obviously, a student can't have every single, you know, a background in, in mobility, contract analytics, you know, automated. Like, are there certain qualities in students that you're often looking for, or even new lawyers, younger lawyers, more junior professionals that stand out that they can kind of take away from our discussion? Um, again, you know, over the last 10 years, especially in, in the e-discovery world, a lot of, a lot of, you know, first year and second year associates got their technology on the job, you know, on the job training uh, where they would be taught a certain tool. And to Charles's point, if in the next case they used a different e-discovery tool, if they were good in one, there was a high likelihood that they were going to quickly pick up and be good at the next. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, we're seeing this, we're seeing this with, with artificial intelligence. I mean, my guess is Charles doesn't have a lot of lawyers coming to him with any artificial intelligence experience. He's, he's probably got a model for what he's looking for in terms of aptitude and in terms of um, uh, attitude. Um, but it's got to be super rare to see somebody graduating with any skill set in artificial intelligence. And so I think what we're all saying is that this is, you know, this is the first inning. We know it's coming. Um, there's talk about it. There's awareness. But there's just huge opportunity because so, so few, you know, law students are graduating with these skill sets. I just wanted to also share a couple of other um insights from the people I spoke with in the research. So one law firm leader said interest in a particular industry or vertical is great, right? So where all of these things could be applied and self-awareness with some potential training under their belt, which is kind of like what, what Charles just mentioned. Another law firm partner said the ability that we should teach this generation patience and audience understanding, a passion for problem solving, because there's going to be a fight for the gray areas. And I found those comments to be particularly powerful as opposed to teach a certain technical approach, much more of, a, of an advanced kind of problem solving that law schools have been doing for quite some time, especially law schools that have been focused on practical experience. Is there a cultural shift, Dean Crowell, required to take this level of education to the next step? Um, I think that um, the more law schools uh, grapple with the changes in the profession and the requirements and needs of firms and clients, I think the easier it will become to develop programs uh, like ours. I think that there need to be a few innovative and courageous law schools to sort of step outside of the box, think creatively and meaningfully, uh, and, and, and develop some models that can then be a, a adopted and adapted uh, throughout the, the 205 law schools in the country. So I, I think there's a bit of a cultural shift, but I think it's, a, it's one that is uh, understood and there's a growing recognition for uh, the adaptation in, in the near term. One of the things I wanted to just point out to the audience was, you know, we asked a variety of questions like this one. Does your firm currently provide training for its lawyers in any of the following areas? And you can see where there's training, where training is sort of increasing. And, and the other thing we talked about was would coursework or certification give employees or prospective employees an advantage? And you see that the numbers are, are a little bit different, a little bit higher in some respects. And additionally, would coursework or certification from a corporation standpoint, would that give a, you know, any kind of an advantage? Charles, are you seeing 
students or junior professionals coming out with any kind of sp specific focus you know given the fact that some of the professionals that i that i interviewed want to see more of a skill that allows them to adapt patients understanding and enthusiasm for an area of particular interest but not necessarily a level of expertise are you seeing when you're talking to people or even i would imagine there are probably in-house people correct me if i'm wrong here in-house people who are in the law department or or in it or in an, in a similar a related area who have um you know an interest but not necessarily a level of expertise are you seeing people with specific expertise or are you seeing people who are just recognizing this is the wave of the future so few pieces here so um generally um i'm finding that people don't even know that these are needs in the marketplace. So, you know, students more generally don't know that, you know, knowing how to use artificial intelligence software, which really, you know, just to be clear, like it's a, it evolved, you know, one area that, that, you know, really evolved with AI is e-discovery. So it's like, if you go to law firms, you say, you're using AI and they might say no, when they are using AI software for e-discovery, they're actually using it. We just, we're pointing at something else. Um, they actually use it much more um, broadly than they think. Um, that being said is uh, once you demystify these topics, which I try to do internally and externally um, at my firm, we people start to buy into it because they realize it's not as you don't have just because it uses a um, you know a technologist word or a kind of futuristic term. You know, doesn't mean that you have to be a futurist or a technologist or a programmer or coder to understand this. I am not any of those things. I am someone who, you know, patience isn't one of my virtues. So, but um, uh, I'm someone who tries to understand things that I that, that I'm interested in and like to do, and I'm motivated around those those topics and kind of building um, building products and. People who want to build, who want to provide advice, and who want to impact and bring value instantly, um, can do that with with this, you know, with this skill set with learning this area. Does it require a certificate? Um, I have never seen a certificate for any of these things, but that's just me um, because I don't I don't think. But it, it helping validate and going through courses, I think it does give people an edge. Um, that being said. The, the the skill set around um, being able to understand and how to work with a gray area. How do I what what does the gray area mean for me with this with dealing with this product or service? Does it amount to what type of risk? Um, operationally, how do I think about that? Um, legally, how do I think about that? Those are all the kind of layered thinking that law students can build as as a skill set. Um, so you know that's really where where what I'm seeing, at least, um, regard, regarding that. It's interesting that these are, when we ask about coursework, would a coursework or certification give your employees perspective, employees an advantage? These were kind of the figures. And then if you hire, would skills and idea follow make you choose one candidate or another? The numbers were, you know, you can see there's a similarity in terms of what's most popular, what's most interesting, where are you going to gain certain advantages and so when we asked about you know what can law schools do according to corporations how can law schools better prepare their students they talked about project management training uh, practical experience but one thing i wanted to turn to because we've asked about law firms we've asked about law schools but we did something that i thought was quite unique and inspired by the, the dean which was to host two different focus groups of actual students. And Steve, you and I sat through one of them and the students were incredible, just a wonderfully open and enthusiastic group of students. Was there anything about that experience, about speaking directly to students and asking about their misconceptions and their hopes for their career that you found most powerful? I think the thing that I found most powerful was sort of the hunch that you and I had um, which was that 
when when presented with where the most opportunity is in terms of where they could practice law or how they could practice law that they would be interested in that area and so for example a lot of people talked about you know when they start law school they want to be an ip lawyer they want to be an international lawyer they may not really know what that means um, but, but then when we presented data to them and said well what if we told you that if you know you had skills in the data privacy area or the, the, the requirement for data privacy attorneys is going to grow exponentially in the next 10 years. Would you be interested? And everybody raised their hand, literally 100%, you know, raised their hand. And I think that confirms that given the information as to what the real opportunities are in the legal marketplace, you're going to get students gravitating uh, to that because like like most students, they want to, you know, get a job and start practicing after they graduate. Dean Crowell, how does the Business of Law Institute ultimately align the interests of students, of law firms, and of corporations? Well, I think one of the one of the nice things is um, the early stage aspects of the institute um, really bring together that just that student interest that um, you and Steve were just talking about, along with um, a very real set of perspectives and assumptions that are being brought to the table by firms and corporations. And I think what it really will do is allow us to develop a best in class program and learn from uh, uh, learn from our experience to really refine a set of approaches to provide very modern legal education in a frontier setting. We're in a frontier setting right now. So I think what we do here matters uh, uh, a tremendous amount in terms of um, not only the exploration of uh, defining and refining curricular opportunities for students on both understanding the principles of the practice that they will engage in, but also to get that hands-on experience. But this will evolve over time and become uh, a mainstay of uh, law school curricula going forward. So I think, I think this not only aligns interests today, and to shape this new dimension of the profession. But I think this will be groundbreaking in setting uh, and concretizing approaches for tomorrow and what, and what will be the new modern legal education. So as part of this, I understand that New York Law School is going to have a masterclass series and was hoping you can talk about that, maybe about the, the learning lab as well. Sure, so we're having a, a series of master classes and for those of you who don't know what master classes are there um, they provide a it's a, a limited uh, number of hours but it gives you a deep dive into different subject matter um, that is all re related to the business of law and we're having um, uh, master class areas on cybersecurity. Um, uh, Charles, you're going to be doing a master class, and you want to mention what that's about. Um, uh, but these master classes will allow students to really understand the principles of uh, different areas of practice and planning and project management and how technology works in application. Um, and as a companion to that, we're going to be uh, pairing our students uh, with employers who will give them externship opportunities. Um, and really, th that'll be uh, part of the Learning Lab series, so externships and opportunities to, to get hands-on experience in, in a classroom setting here. Charles, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the, one of the classes, you know, this goes to, I would say, more largely the awareness is to explain, you know, where do lawyers fit in into the marketplace and what skills do they need? Um, and really going into, you know, to the extent we can, that that uh, depth into these subject matters. So we're going to be talking about, or, or I plan to in my master class talking about artificial intelligence, its application in the business practice. Um, uh, talking about uh, blockchain distributive ledger, contract analytics, smart contracts, smart forms, contract generation, contract lifecycle management, all different subjects that sound very like 
they might some of them sound very mainstream some of them sound very lawyerly but in reality they are required and needed by our businesses um, and the ability for uh, me and my team to provide advice and facilitate that is key for them and me showing the you know opening up this door for students and being able to shed light on these areas and how the skills what skill sets they are and how they're being used for AI for distributive ledger for blockchain for smart contracts contract analytics um, really like a fintech suite is really um, going to be able to build that oh, I didn't realize that we could be doing this. I thought I had to only go in here. I didn't realize that lawyers were doing that or could be doing that. And, and that awareness is really the momentum to be able to continue and build out these programs. And that's the, that's the idea. And then, you know, these will lead to, I think, the, the school aligning to the market and more importantly, the job market. So those are things that we are, you know, I am personally focused on um, doing. Are we going to go into um, talking about who invented AI and what does it mean? And, you know, based on that definition from the early 1900s, no, we're not. We're not going to be going into that. We're going to be going into what the types of technologies are, where do they exist, how do they work, um, what are the use cases, how does it relate to the law, what regulations are coming out that are helping facilitate these types of technology usages in the marketplace, are they becoming standard, what are the expectations of regulators, et cetera. So those are the things that we're going to be, be doing and, and talking about within that one session um and that's uh i think that and i think my uh colleagues and peers who are going to be doing the others have um you know they're not going to be talking about the same subjects as me or, or but they may overlap they're going to be talking about the same level of practicalism in, a, in the marketplace and we're not going to be talking about in theory or hypothetically or the um descending opinion of this case was x i'm not we're not, i'm not going to be going into that we're going to be going into this is what we're doing today this is where we see it going these are the new things that are entering the market I want to point out that the URL on the screen is where you can download the report uh, from the New York Law School website where it's uh, dedicated. I also want to express my gratitude. I don't think we have time for questions, but I want to express my gratitude to uh, Dean Crowell, to Charles Post, and to Steve Harbour for their participation, for especially for you know their vision of making the business of law institute something special. And I feel privileged to have. Uh, provided some research support. And if you have questions, you can email me uh, or Aaron Bond uh, at New York Law School about uh, some of the various issues. And uh, David, Austin, thank you so very much. All right, thank you very much as well. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today um, as part of the Innovative Law Practice Techniques Series. I'd also like to thank Ari, our presenters, Dean Anthony Crowell and Charles Post, as well as as well as David Roof and the rest of the ABA LP Division's Legal Project Management Committee for producing this session. Uh, if any of you have anything else you'd like to say before we close things down to today, uh, feel free to do so now. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, this is David. I'd just like to express my gratitude to this panel for a, a great session. Um, it's it's you know prompted a lot of questions in in my mind, which I uh, hope to. Uh, float to Ari and Aaron uh, after the session, but thank you very much. And, and thank you also for, um, you know, promoting this survey. Um, I think it's, it's very revealing um, and it's going to help uh, new students, I, you know, understand, you know, how they need to position themselves to be competitive in the future marketplace. All right. Yeah. Thank you, David. And uh, thanks for all of your help as well. I'll now conclude this webinar. Have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks again for attending. Great, thank you. Thank you.